Levi Belfield is popular, funny, and courteous. A man who playfully wraps women around his finger and makes men think he's their best friend. His neighbors appreciate his helpfulness. He looks after the apartments of his acquaintances when they are away on holiday. He is the perfect friend and neighbor. And a ticking time bomb. Because if you look closer, the beautiful facade crumbles. A facade that he has carefully pulled up and behind which the other Levi hides. The Levi who lurks behind the facade, plagued by humiliating childhood memories, who hates women, who is addicted to control, and who thinks everyone is his enemy. He can still hear the laughter of the other children in his head, taunting him because he is small and weak. But there is more, there are also the unpleasant rumors going around about him. They call him Bubsy because he is said to have consorted with his sister's rabbit. Even the giggles of the beautiful girls who want nothing to do with him still echo in his head. Then, at home a child, as after running the gauntlet in the hostile world, Levi sinks into the arms of his mother and his only confidant. She treats him like the wounded child he sees himself as. Until his teenage years, she spoils the boy like a toddler. She cares for and caresses him. Levi and his mother have a particularly close relationship, in fact, fear already mutually dependent. A relationship that will shape him forever. The insecurity and fear of childhood develops over time into anger and firm determination. Never again will anyone laugh at him. He wants to be strong and manly. Levi also does not shy away from pumping up his muscles with steroids to achieve this goal. As a bouncer in the nightclub, he now decides who is allowed to join in and who has to shiver outside in the cold. However, the sneering laughter of the beautiful girls from his childhood forever torments him. Perhaps to compensate for these experiences, Levi seeks partners whom he can control and dominate. They have to cut up his food and even taste it. While the anger, hatred and insecurity continue to ferment in Levi, his friendly facade works it holds and earns him prestige and the trust of his fellow men. But the clock in the man ticks on inexorably and counts down to zero. Every day he is one step closer to the inevitable explosion. It is the beginning of 2002, 13-year-old Amanda Jane Dowler, known as Millie, lives with her family in Walton-on-Thames, a small town about a half-hour drive from London. On the 21st of March, 2002 Millie leaves Heathside School in Weybridge at 3.07pm and goes with a friend to Weybridge Station where they board the train together. The girls get off at Walton-on-Thames Station, one stop before their usual stop in Hersham, and go to the station cafe for dinner. After Millie calls her father at 3.47 p.m. to inform him that she will be home in half an hour. The girls leave the cafe at 4.05 p.m. and each make their way home alone. A few minutes later, Millie is seen by a friend of her sister walking along the street, laughing and waving. This is the last time anyone sees the girl alive. At 7 o'clock p.m., Millie is finally reported missing by her parents. A nationwide search for her begins. Hundreds of police comb the forests, rivers, and roads surrounding Hersham. Even helicopters are used to search for the missing girl. A week later, despite an intensive search, there is still no trace of Millie. The police are at a loss and assume that Millie was not kidnapped but ran away on her own accord. After all, there are no indications of a crime having been committed. But how likely is it that a 13-year-old girl would simply run away? All alone? For that long? Wouldn't she at least leave a note or pack a bag with essentials? As much as Millie's parents hope that their daughter has run away voluntarily, maybe gone on an adventure, is doing well somewhere, they can't get anything out of the police theory. Because this is not the Millie they know and love. And they will be right. Their Millie will never come back and knock on their door again. After almost six uncertain months between hope and desperation, mushroom pickers discover human remains in the Yateley Heath Woods near Yateley, Hampshire, on the 18th of September, 2002. The dental findings bring the sad certainty it is Millie. Due to the advanced decomposition of the body, the cause of death cannot be determined. What is astonishing is that the body has been completely stripped. No clothing or possessions will ever be found. The missing person's case now becomes a murder investigation. A murder investigation that will take many years. In which traces will keep popping up that led nowhere. Horrible phone calls and emails to the parents that their daughter has been caught by a human trafficking ring. All lies, as it turns out years later. Lies which by then, have nearly driven the family mad. Marsha McDonnell is a talented musician and is described by people as calm and hardworking. Before starting her studies, the young woman wants to discover the white world and plans to travel to the other end of the earth to Australia. However, she will never make this journey. In February 2003, Marsha is on her way home from a movie night with her friends. She is only a few meters away from her house in Hampton, southwest London, when she is brutally attacked. 
Someone hits the 18-year-old from behind on the head with a blunt object, several times, and the young woman goes straight to the ground. The perpetrator simply leaves the badly injured Marsha lying there. Two days later, the future musician dies in hospital from her injuries. The police are left with a mystery. There are no witnesses to the crime, no helpful evidence to suggest the murderer or his motive. Only the murder weapon is the subject of some speculation. Based on the autopsy findings, it is assumed that the blunt object could have been a hammer. Statistically speaking, most victims know their killers. Usually, they acquaintances, are or friends, family members. Only in very few cases do the perpetrators not know their victims. But in Marsha's case, the investigators quickly exclude all acquaintances of having any involvement. No one has a motive, there's no evidence to support it. Is there a mad killer on the streets of London? One who randomly selects his victims entirely at will. One who doesn't follow a pattern. On the 28th of May, 2004, more than a year after the attack on Marsha, 18-year-old Kate Sheedy is hit by a white van while crossing a street in an industrial estate in Isleworth. Luckily, she survives. After several weeks in hospital she can resume her normal life. The case is reported and published. At first glance, this case has little to do with the deadly attack on Marsha. But if you look closer, only the murder weapon is different. If you replace the hammer with the car, there are parallels, which unfortunately are recognized much too late. Amélie Delagrange is a 22-year-old French exchange student. After missing the bus, she decides to make her way on foot in the mild summer night of the 19th of August, 2004. However, this proves to be a fatal decision as she runs straight into the hands of her murderer. Amélie is found seriously injured in Twickenham Green and that very night she dies in hospital from severe head injuries. What is at first only a suspicion, now slowly becomes certainty, a serial killer is on the move in London. A murderer who seems to have no real motive and kills out of pure murderous lust. There is no connection between Marsha, Amelie and later Kate. The young women didn't know each other, have no mutual friends. Yet they fell victim to the same hand. The lack of connection presents the investigators with an almost impossible task. Or is it significant that they all have blonde hair? The case of Amelie Delagrange is assigned to Detective Chief Inspector Colin Sutton, although he is relatively inexperienced in murder investigations and there is hardly any useful evidence for him to work with. The police are now looking for a killer who targets young blonde women. He is apparently not interested in sex, but in hurting and killing. But why did he want to extinguish the lives of these young women? He is compared to a hunter on the prowl, who watches his victims and feels superior to his prey. The mysterious perpetrator leaves no evidence behind. Hardly any mistakes are made, and he plans his attacks carefully. There are no DNA traces, but in the case of Amelie something has disappeared. Amelie's mobile phone. Could this be a valuable lead? Could the killer have taken the phone as a trophy? Sutton and his team managed to get the phone company's data on the device. And this evaluation contains an important hint, a few minutes after the attack, the device loses the network for a moment. At that time, the phone was located in Walton-on-Thames, far away from the crime scene. So, the murderer is mobile. He is probably traveling by car. On video surveillance near the crime scene, a suspicious white van stands out. One of 24,000 white vans registered in the UK. It's a small, seemingly unimportant lead. A marginal note. But Sutton's following up on it. In a single clue filed on the case of Kate Sheedy and a white van, the investigator then finds the testimony of a certain Joe Collins. She claims that her ex-partner owns a white van and hates blonde women. She said that he was a violent man and that she thought he might kill her. She also reported that, in his house, she found a magazine in which blonde women's faces were cut up. This makes the investigators sit up and take notice. The ex-partner of whom Joe Collins reports is called Levi Belfield and is now the main suspect in the Amelie Delagrange case. Born on the 17th of May, 1968 in Isleworth, London, Levi Belfield is one of five children in the Roma family. When the little boy is 10 years old, his father dies of leukemia. A heavy blow of fate that brings Levi and his mother closer together. She cares for him and pampers him. Maybe because of the loss of his father, she always lets Levi know how special he is. Levi remains dependent on his mother's affection until adulthood. He is unable to emotionally emancipate himself from her and thus to develop freely and normally. At the age of 13, he is already caught in petty theft. But nothing happens. He experiences no consequences for the offenses, which results in a feeling of superiority over the police. At the age of 21, he meets his first wife, with whom he will have five children. Outwardly not attractive and man, Levi knows how to win women over with his eloquence and his nonchalant manner. 
he sees himself as a gift to the female sex, which has to obey him unconditionally as a reward for his attention. One says in retrospect that the women were only allowed to speak when he allowed it. Only cook what he likes. Only go to the toilet when he accompanied them. They were reload to have a mobile phone, on which the only number stored was Levi's. He, however, has many partners. Likes to be in and out of relationships. Every day he hits his partners, but not in the face. He is too smart for that. That would leave visible marks. But none of the women dares to report him. Again, he gets away with his behavior. In the meantime, he feels untouchable. Superior. But when the police come with a search warrant, he hides naked in the attic. The police discover him and take him away. During the interrogation, Belfield refuses to testify, turns his back demonstratively to the police, and stares stubbornly at the wall. His behavior resembles that of a defiant child. After 18 months in custody, Levi Belfield is charged on the 2nd of March, 2006 with the murder of Amelie and the attempted murder of Kate. The murder of Marsha is added as a further charge on the 25th of May, 2006. The trial begins on the 12th of October, 2007 and Levi Belfield pleads not guilty to all charges. He follows the trial emotionlessly, seeming downright bored. Only when he testifies does Levi take action trying to wrap the jury around his finger with his notorious charm. Without success. The circumstantial evidence weighs heavily. There are several video recordings that show him driving aimlessly around in his white van. Like a hunter in search of his prey. On the 25th of February 2008, Levi is found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment. One day after the verdict of guilty, another charge is brought against him. This time it is about the murder of Millie. There is a lot of evidence pointing to Belfield, his place of residence, video recordings showing how the red car of his girlfriend at the time, which he had borrowed, circles around the crime scene and a colleague of Levi testifies that he confessed the murder of Millie to her in 2002. She thought it was nonsense, pomposity, a lie. Belfield obviously enjoys this trial, he instructs his lawyer to tear Millie's family apart in court. He is enjoying one last time in public, living out his destructive side. Again, he is found guilty and receives a second life sentence without the possibility of probation. In 2016, still in prison, Levi describes the murder of Millie in all the gruesome and horrible details. A confession. But he withdraws this right afterwards. Is it a cry for attention, or does he just want to play a sadistic game with the relatives of his victims? For Millie's family, it feels as if he has killed Millie a second time. For Levi's ex-partner, Joe, he is pure evil. He is unscrupulous, cold, and only concerned with his own advantage. Many people will agree with her because the facts speak for themselves. Is it a hidden clue or rather irony of fate that this man is called Levi? Because if you rearrange the letters, they spell the word, evil.